invitación. Uh, bienvenidos, bienvenidas a todas y todos. Um, uh, and so I, I'm going to switch to English because actually I'm going to give the talk in, in English. Um, yeah, so welcome everybody. Uh, so I hope you had a good start in the semester and uh, I hope we're going to have a nice colloquium uh, virtually this semester. And I'm trying my best to, to make the kickstart here. Uh, so my, my plan for today um, is actually not so much to give a talk on some recent project or something, but rather to give uh, an overview on, on tropical geometry. So I really want to take this opportunity to, to introduce myself finally, uh, a bit lately, but finally, at least like in, on a mathematical level. And so I want to talk about some basics of tropical geometry and I want to give you some ideas of uh, main applications that that tropical geometry has and uh, of obviously with a focus on on topics that that I am interested in and that are of interest to me so there's of course many other things that that I could talk about so this is not the most recent stuff the results I'm going to present but then again tropical geometry is only about 20 years old so it also is not terribly old at the same time. So it's not, not too bad. Uh, so that's the plan for today. We're gonna to start with tropical geometry and then we're gonna talk about applications in enumerative geometry. And then if maybe, I, I think I prepared too much material. So maybe we won't even have time for the, for the third topic, but the third topic would be topology of real algebraic varieties. And please, whenever there are questions, uh, obviously uh, please, ask questions. I'm also following the chat in case, but I obviously I'm also happy to hear other voices. So, okay, so let's, let's start. Oh, I already came at, uh, yeah. So let's start with uh, tropical geometry. And so of course there's um, many approaches that you can take to tropical geometry. I, I'm gonna take the route that, that I took personally myself. So I, I, I was educated uh, algebraic geometer and then at some, some point I learned about this weird uh, geometry that, that was coming up at this time, which is called tropical geometry. So I'm gonna take the point of view of um, coming from algebraic geometry, okay? And what is algebraic geometry? Well, I just, uh, I mean, here's a, here's a picture. So what we do in algebraic geometry is we take a polynomial equation. So here I took a polynomial equation in three variables, x, y, z, and uh, so I, I think I can, so here's the equation. I chose some coefficients, A, B, C, D, and so on. And then um, I'm looking at the zero set of, of this um, equation, okay? And then you can get funny pictures like, like the one here. So I should say maybe that this, this is a polynomial of degree four. So this is called a, a quartic surface, what you, can, what you can see here. And for example, you can now try to study the relationship between the polynomial and the, the geometry that you get. So for example, here, the degree of the polynomial, you can see it by, if you try to visualize a line that goes through this hyperplane like this, then you can see that this line intersects this, this uh, hypersurface in four points. And that's, so this is a geometric fact that corresponds to the algebraic fact that the polynomial has, has degree four. And so now I'm gonna uh, show you the same picture essentially in tropical geometry. So this is a, a tropical quartic surface. So probably the picture is too bad to really see something. So the, the main point here is that it's uh, uh, kind of like comparing to this picture, this is of course something curved, something geometrically complicated. And this here is a polyhedral complex. So this is something piecewise linear, which is kind of built from, uh, from polyhedra, okay? And uh, I wanna tell you um, how you can get such objects by changing this usual approach of uh, taking zeros of a polynomial. Uh, we're gonna change this a little bit and then we're gonna end up with pictures like this. So that's the first, uh, first thing I wanna talk about. 
Um, so um, let me start with uh, tropical arithmetics. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to change the usual operations of addition and multiplications to get these uh, polyhedral objects instead of the curvy objects that I showed in, in the beginning. So the tropical arithmetic is a very simple. Um, the, our base, um, our range of numbers is just the real numbers and we're adding an element minus infinity. And then we make some funny definitions. So we define tropical addition as taking the maximum of two numbers and tropical multiplication as taking the usual addition of two numbers. Okay, so that's that's going to be my tropical operations here, and uh, well, that's that's of course a kind of maybe funny definition, uh, and particular it has one great uh, drawback, and the drawback is that this definition of course doesn't give uh, a field, not even a ring, because the uh, addition is highly non-invertible, so you, you you usually never have. Uh, inverses for addition here because the, the, the neutral element for addition is exactly this minus infinity element that we added by hand. And well, you can never, I mean, if you if you take the maximum of two numbers and you will never get minus infinity except for both of these numbers are minus infinity. So that's, that's kind of the drawback of this uh, tropical arithmetics. And that's why, in fact, um, what I just told you is just inspiration but in fact it's very different from classical algebraic geometry but let's forget about this and let's continue like we would do in in algebraic geometry so the next object we're going to consider is polynomials and we this is just we have addition and we have multiplication so we can talk about tropical polynomials okay we're just using we're just replacing usual addition and multiplication by tropical addition and multiplication and what this means, in fact, is just, of course, you can rewrite this in ordinary um, arithmetics, and then you just get, uh, so a, a tropical mon monomial like this here, it just corresponds to a affine linear function. Note that the exponents, they turn into the linear coefficients of my, of my function, and the coefficient just turns into the, uh, yeah, the, the shift. Um, of my of my function and then summing up tropically just means taking a maximum over these functions so what will these functions look like here i have a very simple example i have a tropical polynomial zero plus x plus y and this is nothing else but the maximum over zero x and y and well that's that's what the function looks like it's just a piecewise linear convex function uh, it has these three domains of linearity and well so here there's a piece where it's where it's zero and then that's the piece where it's where it, where x is maximal and that's the piece where y is maximal okay so that's that's what this curve um, looks like and that that's what a tropical polynomial looks like and now uh, so that's the important definition here so what's what's a tropical hypersurface so i want to define something now that corresponds to the zero set of a tropical polynomial and actually, I'm going to use a strange uh, claim. I mean, maybe it's not clear right away why this is a good definition, but I'm going to define a tropical hypersurface as the corner locus of F. So let me give you again this picture. So here is our tropical polynomial, and clearly it has these um, it has these loci where it breaks, right? And we define the these loci as the tropical hypersurface. So here is another picture where I kind of have the, the three domains of lineality and these three rays, this is actually my tropical hypersurface in this case, okay? So the three rays with this vertex, vertex, that's what I call a tropical line in this case, because it's given by a polynomial of degree one. Okay, and here I have a slightly more advanced picture of a, of a tropical conic. So this is a polynomial in, are still in two variables, but of degree two. And the graph of this function, again, tropical polynomial just is a maximum over affine linear function. So it, this is the function and the loci where this function breaks. That's the graph that you can see here in the, in the plane. And that's what we call the tropical hypersurface of F. 
And okay, so here I just gave you, here's another picture of, a, that's a quadric. So that's a, again, degree two, but in the, in space, in R3. That's the kind of objects that you can get. Um, and uh, so now I want to focus on planar curves. So that's the easiest case of uh, tropical objects that you can consider, and it will be sufficient for the purpose of this talk. So let's let's describe some of the properties of planar curves. So first of all, I mean we've already seen in the picture that a, a planar tropical curve, so a hypersurface of a polynomial in two variables, is just a graph essentially, right? It's a graph embedded in R2 and it has, well, it has vertices, it has edges, and then it's a maybe a generalized graph in the sense that we also allow rays, okay? So we, we allow these kind of infinite edges of a graph. And the second important property is that all the edges have rational slopes. So in other words, for, for each of these edge, I could give a direction vector in rational coordinates or even integer coordinates, of course, if I, if I prefer. Um, so that is, that is just coming from the fact that these, um, these equalities that gonna describe my, um, um, my edges, they come from exponents in my polynomial. And since uh, polynomials only have integer exponent vectors, all the equations that I'm gonna get have um, kind of um, rational linear part, and that's why I'm gonna get rational slopes here. And then the most important property is the so-called balancing condition. So this is just uh, the following. If you actually, if you pick one of the vertices of your curve mm -hmm. and you look at, so for each edge, you take the kind of the, we call it the primitive generator. So you, you take the first integer vector that points along this edge, okay? And if you sum up all these vectors, then you get zero. That's the so-called balancing condition. So here, for example, this edge has slope. I mean, it has direction minus one, one. And this here has direction one, zero. And this here has direction zero minus one. And so they sum up to zero. That's a, uh, that's a balancing condition. And that's actually also, uh, it's, it's, it also holds in higher dimensions. But OK, here I have it in, in two dimensions. And the, the interesting thing here is that actually these this list of properties is sufficient to ca characterize uh, tropical curves. So you can go the other way around if you want. Uh, any graph that you draw in the plane, which only uses rational slopes and which for every vertex satisfies the balancing condition can be written as a corner locus of such a tropical polynomial, okay? That's sometimes called the yeah, fu fundamental theorem in, in, in tropical geometry. Um, and there, so, so tropical curves are really um, combinatorial objects primarily. And I wanna emphasize this even further by showing you the following pictures. So there exists something which is called dual subdivision. Uh, so to each, um, so th this is actually a subdivision of the Newton polytope of the of the polynomial of the polynomial. In case you you know what that is, so it's yeah. But you can see here the duality that I'm referring to. So this is a, a subdivision of the triangle of size two, and uh, you can clearly see that um, the the triangles here correspond to vertices, and the edges correspond to edges in my curve. And the, um, the vertices of this subdivision, they correspond to the domains of linearity of, um, of my curve. So these dual subdivisions, they actually completely describe the combinatorics of the tropical curves. Uh, that's just, um, so here, here are some more examples of conics and their dual subdivisions. Um, Johannes? Yes. Can, can you explain a little bit how do you do these subdivisions in the triangles? I mean, how, is, how it is an arbitrary subdivision into four triangles, or do you, or is there something more interesting than that? No, yeah. So actually, there is a there is a simple construction how you get from a tropical polynomial 
a subdivision of its Newton polytope. Okay, so they, they are not random subdivisions here, that they, they were constructed using a certain construction. Okay. And then it turns out that these subdivisions are dual to the tropical curve given by the same polynomial. So, so this is why these subdivisions are useful because they give you a combinatorial description of, of, your, of the curve in this case. Okay. All right. Um, but I, yeah, I, I think we're not going to use them too much, so I, I don't want to give the construction. <laughs> Uh, wait, I cannot. Uh -huh. is it, are all the vertices trivalent or could there be more? Uh, yes, absolutely. The, the, um, actually, these curves here are called smooth curves. They, they, there is a that's kind of the tropical counterpart or analog of, of smoothness is, uh, well, it's a certain definition, but in particular, it involves. Um, so that planar curves will only be trivalent, but you could also have tropical curves uh, which have high, higher valent vertices, just that then we wouldn't call them smooth curves. They would be singular curves in our terminology, but it, it does exist. So actually we will see some curves later, maybe. Okay, I'm still making. Okay, a question, now that they asked that, in, okay. in, in let's say algebraic geometry, you have like fat lines and fat points. You can say not only it's a line, but it has like multiplicity yes. two or whatever, and then you have fat points and so on. Is there any analog of that kind of uh, degree here or it just disappears? No, there is some analog. So actually I, I put, so actually these, um, these hypersurfaces are equipped with weights um, and these weights, they they play a similar role. I mean, they, they would correspond to FET schemes, uh, but, um, but this is much more rough information. So for example, for a FET point, we would just remember the multiplicity of this FET point. And of course, you maybe know that, uh, the, like, uh, the, you can even study the moduli space of FET points and it's something non-trivial, uh, non right? So um, it's much, much rougher, much simpler information that we have tropically. And we don't have a full scheme theory, for example. Okay, but there is some uh, multiplicity information that I just didn't mention, actually. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So now we um, we're gonna need two invariants that you associate with uh, curves. So that if you know about planar curves, then you know there is two invariants that you usually, I mean, that are of interest. So the first invariant is just the degree of the curve, and that's easy to define. It's just the degree of the polynomial that defines the curve. Um, and tropically, you maybe by now already guess how you can see the degree of a curve. Um, because, so for example, this here is given by a degree three polynomial, and you can see the degree by counting, for example, all the rays that go downstairs or all the rays that go to the uh, to the left hand side, <laughs> or all the rays that go diagonally. Okay, uh, these are kind of the canonical directions in tropical geometry. If you pick something special, then you can can get other directions. But if you pick a generic polynomial, then these are the uh, then you can just these are the directions that, that you get, and you can just determine the degree by counting, for example, the rays that go downstairs. Okay. These rays actually correspond to intersection with a coordinate line, yeah, with the various coordinate lines of P2, if you think about projective curves for the for the experts here. But yeah, never mind. So that's the that's the decree. I just um, and the second important invariant, I'm still making dots here, that's the genus. Uh, and again, so so my kind of if you know about algebraic geometry, then you should notice that, that the idea of tropical geometry is that it should be much simpler than uh, algebraic geometry. So in algebraic geometry also, there already there's various definitions of how you can define the genus of a curve. And here we just say it's the first Betty number of the curve. So that just means counting the loops uh, in my graph, counting the independent loops of my graph. So for example, this curve here has one loop. And so we say it has genus 
one, okay? And there is actually a small exception here. So that's why, I, okay, so here actually I have a curve which has a vertex which is not trivalent, but which is four-valent, and it's just a crossing of two edges. And in this case, we actually think of these edges as being separate. So actually, we think of this curve as being parametrized by a graph which doesn't intersect here. And just in the image, uh, we have this intersection point. And this is why here, I'm actually saying this curve here has genus zero, because this picture here can be parametrized by a graph which has no loop, and hence we call it genus zero, okay? So that's maybe already too, too much details, but just I wanna uh, give you in the applications, I wanna give you the precise statements in a, in a second. Um, and now, okay, now I wanna give you a slide, which is, so, so far it was only uh, pictures, and now I wanna give you a slide that looks a bit more intimidating maybe, but it's kind of the, the, the idea is to show you how, to give you an example of how these, pictures that I've just shown you are related to this classical algebraic geometry that you might be interested in from the start, okay? And, and here's the setup. So I, I take a polynomial Ft, and this is a complex polynomial. So this is something which belongs to the ordinary world of complex algebraic geometry, okay? Uh, just uh, the only thing is that it's actually not just one polynomial, but it's a family of polynomials. So this parameter of the family is the parameter t, and these coefficients, hence, they depend on this parameter t, okay? So it's a family in t of complex polynomials, and I'm going to make an assumption on the growth rate of these uh, coefficients. So I'm going to assume that these, um, so for t going to infinity, I'm going to assume that these coefficients grow like t to the Aij, where Aij is some real number, okay? That's my assumption here. And now I'm gonna turn this into a tropical polynomial. And here's what I'm doing. I'm just taking this exponent here, which measures, the, which measures how fast this uh, coefficient grows, and I just turn it into my coefficient of a tropical polynomial, okay? So now I have two things. I have a family of complex uh, polynomials and I have a tropical polynomial. And now, now, okay, this is, now comes the part that should shock everybody that comes from algebraic geometry. Now I'm gonna do something brutal to my um, nice algebraic geometry world. I'm gonna apply logarithm, okay? So this is, so I call this map log T and it's the map from C star two to R two. And it just maps uh, set W to uh, coordinate wise. I'm taking absolute value, and then I'm taking logarithm with basis with basis t. I, I can can you see my mouse pointer or yes? Yeah, you can see it. Okay. Um, and then the theorem. Uh, so this is kind of the one, also one of the fundamental theorems in entropic geometry. It says that it says the following. So it says that. Uh, Take, take V of F. So V of F is the ordinary um, hypersurface associated to these complex polynomials, meaning it's the, uh, it's the solutions, I mean, it's the zeros of these polynomials, okay? Consider it in C star two. So we, we search for complex solutions, but we do not allow um, coordinates to be zero. That's just because logarithm isn't defined uh, in this case. And then we, we take the image of this you come a classical algebraic hypersurface uh, under logarithm. And uh, now like a miracle happens, namely that in the limit for T to infinity, this is equal to the tropical hypersurface. So here's a quick picture. So actually what I've drawn here is um, that's for degree three. And uh, if you just take, um, a curve of degree three, and you just map it uh, with this logarithm map here, okay? Then you get, you're gonna get some funny picture like, like this one here. So this is called an amoeba actually, uh, because it always looks like this. It has these tentacles which go to infinity and it has these kind of uh, interior parts which maybe look like some, some piece of, of the amoeba. I, I forgot what kind of, uh, uh, if they have a stomach, <laughs> I guess they don't have a stomach, but they, they have something. 
And, um, and then what this limit process does is again, actually we're kind of starving these amoebas. So um, they, they run out of nutrition and they get thinner and thinner. And then in the limit, they converge to what is called their skeleton. And that's just the, the tropical curve here, okay? So um, this is maybe, um, if you're not, I mean, this is maybe not completely, well, that's an that's a important theorem. And the, the punchline here is that you can think of tropical geometry as classical algebraic geometry, but in logarithmic coordinates, okay? And this is not quite true because actually in logarithmic coordinates, you would get pictures like this, which are rather complicated. So you need to do some limit process, some degeneration to end up here at these nice piecewise polynomial, piecewise linear objects. Okay, and just to finish this section, just to, so what, what are the main ideas here? So obviously applying logarithmic coordinates to something from algebraic geometry, that's a old, uh, that's a very old idea. It goes back at least to, to Newton, I guess. And so this idea of linearization of algebraic geometry by using logarithmic coordinates, it's kind of one of the ideas behind, behind this approach. You can also think about it uh, the other way around. So um, you can think about, so some of these objects, they look, uh, this looks very similar to to functions, for example, that show up in optimization or in, in convex geometry. And you can think about it the other way around. You, you're kind of adding new ideas from algebraic geometry by considering these objects not just as polyhedral uh, complexes, but as hypersurfaces of some polynomial, for example. And th these ideas also showed up in the context of dequantization um, in, in various, um, yeah, in, on, on various levels. Sometimes it's just a naive philosophical idea and sometimes it's really, it has some mathematical content, but this is also one of the sources of, of this um, strange tropical geometry, okay? Okay, so maybe questions up to here? Does anybody have questions for Johannes? No. Okay, so then let's switch to the first um, application. So again, I really gonna focus on pictures and uh, I hope that there's something for, for, for everybody. Um, so let's start with a picture, as I said. So what's, what's the numerative geometry? Well, um, of course, as every serious subject, you should, have, you should be able to trace it back to the Greeks. So here's my, my example from the Greeks. Uh, the, so the Greeks, of course, they did geometry in this constructive way. They, they formulated the problem. So is there a triangle which has this side and this point and whatever? And then they gave a construction of how to construct this triangle. And moving on to more complicated problems, they, they realized that sometimes uh, you have actually several choices of how to do the construction and you get a certain number of solutions to your problem. And the first problem that was studied uh, seriously in this direction is, this, is the problem of the circles of Apollonius. So this is, I think it's very beautiful. Um, this is actually, the, you start with the three black circles and then you ask for, um, then you want to construct a circle that is tangent to all the three circles, okay? And Apollonius gave the construction and he also noticed that actually um, there are choices in this construction and there's exactly eight uh, circles which satisfy this, this condition. And then it took centuries, of course, to make the shift from uh, putting the emphasis on, yeah, not, not so much in uh, the interest in doing the actual construction, but counting how many solutions a certain geometric problem has. So here, for example, of course, the number eight is very easy here to understand because for each, sir, for each of the three circles, you can choose if you want to touch it kind of inside or outside, right? So for example, this circle here in the middle, it touches all the circles uh, outside. And then this, this circle here uh, touches all of the three circles well, it depends on what you mean by inside and outside, I guess, but you know what I, what I mean. Okay. And we're gonna uh, look at the following. That's a 
yeah, it's a very famous problem in, in enumerative geometry. So we're going to look at planar curves and we're just going to fix points. Okay, so you fix some points in the plane and now you want to find a curve that passes through these points. But it's supposed to be an algebraic curve. So we, we're fixing the degree D of the curve. And to make the dimensions work out, if you fix the degree D, then you need uh, exactly this number of points, 3D minus one points. And then you can ask how many rational curves of degree D in, well, projective space, but just think of the plane, pass through these points P1 up to Pn, okay? Um, rational curves means that they essentially can be parametrized by, by polynomial maps. It's, uh, yeah, maybe it's not so important. What if if you know what it means and you know it, and if you don't, then it's not so important. <laughs> um, so that's a very um, famous problem. That's um, I, I even mentioned that. Okay, this corresponds to genus zero or being parameterized by rational functions. Um, and this problem has a long history. So let's go through the history. So let's start with D one. So this means uh, I'm fixing two points and I'm asking how many lines pass through these two points. That's easy, that's just one line. Now I go to degree two, okay? Now I fix five points and I'm asking how many conics, so how many ellipses or hyperbolas or these kind of uh, curves pass through the five points. Then it's already, a, I mean, a very easy, but a, a calculation to check that again, it's just, one solution. So for five points, you will find exactly one ellipse that passes through the five points. And then when you go to degree three and four, it already gets um, slightly non-trivial. So um, for degree three, for example, a rational, uh, yeah, so this is a rational um, curve of degree three, and uh, it has this, it has this one node, that's what, that's how you can see that it's a rational curve, but it's not so important here. Um, and in this case, there are exactly 12 solutions. That's already a computation that was only done in, I mean, like modern, like maybe 150 years ago. And the 620 also maybe 100 years ago, that was possible. But people realized that this problem gets harder and harder for every degree, and they needed a new technique to solve it for every new degree. And that was basically the situation until some physicists came up with uh, ideas coming from string theory and they made predictions for these kind of numbers. So that's a very funny story that I cannot go into in detail here. But um, finally, after method, mathematicians picked it up, um, Konsevich 94 gave a recursive formula for all these for all these numbers. So that's a very beautiful um, subject of, um, of mathematics that was the, the birth of these moduli spaces of stable maps. And he used it to compute uh, these numbers. And you see that they grow um, very rapidly, actually. And now I want to go even one step further. Um, so these, um, I want to define some more um, enumerative numbers, which are slightly more complicated, and I can actually not explain in detail um, what they are. So now we're fixing a degree D, and additionally, we're fixing some numbers K1 up to Kn. And yeah, and, the, and there is a condition that these, these um, they sum up to, to 3D minus one, which is again the di dimension here. And um, we define a number N, and here I wrote the uh, kind of the Gromov-Witten type definition of this number. So this is probably, um, so to, so very, in, in very simple terms, again, if you know what it means, then it's, uh, I don't have to explain it. And if you don't know in very simple terms, this object here, that's the moduli space of the curves that we're looking for. So that's the moduli space of rational curves of degree D in the plane, okay? And writing an integral here just means here I'm writing down some conditions on these curves and writing the integral just means that I want this, I want to count the number of curves that satisfy the, these conditions. And what are these conditions? Well, the first condition, again, this is just fancy notation for a point condition. So here I'm asking 
the curve to pass through a point. And then here, that's the new ingredient, that's the Psi condition. So these are Psi classes, these are famous um, cohomology classes on this moduli space. And they actually come from the, they're just the, the so the, they're the first churn class of the cotangent line bundle associated to the marked point I. So that's definitely something that is uh, complete nonsense for the non-experts. So let me give you an example instead. Uh, it's, so in, in, a, in very simple cases, you can think of these psi conditions as tangency conditions. So for example, the number N2110 is the following. Two is degree, so again, I'm looking at um, ellipses or hyperbola, so this kind of stuff. And then I'm asking uh, here three conditions, so three point conditions, but there are two points where I'm also imposing one psi condition. And this, this just means I'm fixing a tangent line at these points, and I'm asking my, uh, my ellipse to be tangent to this tangent, I mean, to this line uh, at this point, okay? And here you see an example. So imagine, first imagine removing the blue curve. So I'm fixing three points and at two of these points, I'm also fixing lines. And now the question is how many ellipses pass through those three points and have the given tangent lines. And again, I'm unfortunately, I cannot show you serious examples. Again, this, the answer is just one in this case. But these are um, also very, uh, important numbers that have a motivation coming from enumerative geometry. And they are actually, they, they came up in, in these um, relations to physics. So from a physical point of view, they have a very important meaning. And that's also why they have this funny name, gravitational descendants. So uh, these, uh, these psi classes actually in some sense correspond to introducing uh, uh, cra the gravitational force to to a string theory, but that's obviously something I also don't really understand. So let's not. And now let me, okay, how much? Okay, yeah. Um, so now, now let me mention um, uh, the, the main tropical theorem in this context. So um, that really goes back, that's, that's one of the first uh, important theorems in tropical geometry. That's one of the theorems that got the subject started really. So it, it says the following, we're gonna do, um, we're gonna do the, we're gonna take this enumerative problem and translate it to the tropical world now. So this means I'm gonna fix the same number of points P1 up to Pn in R2, okay? And I think of this R2 now as the tropical plane, the plane where these funny graphs sit, okay? And um, I'm asking, I'm counting all tropical curves of a given degree D and genus zero, which pass through the given points. And then I count these curves. But there's one little extra complication here, which is that actually we, we do not count each curve one by one, but we count the curves with multiplicities. And maybe it's not so important here what the multiplicities are, that they, they can be easily defined in terms of the combinatorics of the curve. So here actually I wrote it down, so it's a, it's a product over twice the area. So for each vertex, you take um, the dual cell in this dual subdivision that I mentioned briefly in the beginning. And you take the area of this cell and you multiply it by two, and then you take the product for each vertex. And then this gives you the multiplicity of a curve. And, and you, you, you solve the same counting problem as in the classical world. So here, I again have the simplest examples here. I have two points in the plane and I'm asking how many tropical lines pass through these two points. And tropical lines, if you think a bit about it, they, they, have, they actually always look like this, just up to translations. So the only thing you can do with tropical lines is translate them in the, in the plane. And so it's a, it's a funny, uh, it's, a, it's very, I mean, it's very, it's quite easy to see that there is exactly one tropical line passing through these two points. And, and here's another picture that's probably not as convincing as this one. So here I have five points in the plane and I have a tropical conic passing through the five points. And what I claim is that this is the only tropical conic that passes through these five points. 
that is not so easy to see because you need you would have to check also the other uh, combinatorial types of conics that you can get. But what you can see maybe is that this this conic, for example, I cannot change some of the length or I cannot move it a little bit and it would still satisfy these point conditions. As soon as I change one of the length or move it a little bit, I will lose at least one of these um, points. And here is a and here is a more complicated example. So this is degree three. So in this case, we have eight points uh, that I fixed in the plane. Uh, you, I fix them in this kind of funny way. This has a certain reason, but I, I'm not going to uh, talk about this. And, I, and this is actually a list of all the tropical curves that pass through these points. And so that's the first time that this multiplicity shows up because actually this is how many? It's, it's eight curves. No, it's nine curves. But this curve here, this first curve here, this is counted with uh, multiplicity four. And this is coming from the fact that if you draw the dual subdivision to, to this piece here, then the dual subdivision lo would look locally like, like this here, like uh, two triangles. And you can see that these two triangles, they have area, um, they have area one in usual Euclidean measure. And so multiplying by two, you get two times two and you get multiplicity four here. And all the other ones actually, all the, all the, dual cells are just simple triangles and so you will only get multiplicity one and also just note that really all of these curves are, have genus are rational curves have genus zero so the, this curve is just a tree so there's no loop and these curves they all have a loop in the image but it's only coming from uh, these kind of self intersections of the curve and i remember that i said in the beginning that we think of these intersection points to be removed. So actually this is also, uh, they also don't have loops here, these other curves. And now from the, from the numbers, I guess you can already guess the, the theorem, uh, which is the following. Uh, wait, I think I, ah, no, I, sorry. I actually kind of misread. So here, I think in this slide, I should have, this was already the theorem, okay. So, um, that the theorem says that this, this, this classical enumerative number, uh, ND that I defined a second ago, that this actually equals this tropical count, okay? And we just saw two examples, I mean, three examples of this. So uh, all these numbers agree with the numbers that I mentioned before. And uh, here, that's, that's the result from myself with Hannah Markwich. So that's, um, that was a kind of a, generalization of this result for um, these um, descendant invariants, for these a bit more complicated invariants, which involve psi classes. But the statement reads essentially the same. So these, these numbers that are of interest can be computed tropically by counting tropical curves with the same multiplicities as before, essentially the same multiplicities. And again, we're counting tropical curves of degree D and genus zero. And the new feature here, that's the kind of Psi classes tropically are very easy to understand. Namely, um, we're just asking the curve to have a vertex of a certain valence of a certain degree at such a at such a point. Again, I guess it's easier to look at an example. So let's go back to this example here. So now, um, now again, I have three points, but two of them have these kind of this psi condition. And what does it mean tropically? Tropically, it means that I want a vertex of my curve to pass through this point. And here's the only tropical conic that does that. So it's this graph and it has a vertex here, a vertex here, and this simple point, it just passes, passes through, okay? And again, <laughs> I keep making these dots. Uh, here is the more, yeah, the, the only example that I can still show on a slide. So this is um, degree three again, and now we're having, uh, again, two of these fat points which have a psi condition and all the, and four points which just are simple point conditions. And then the pictures look like this. So here are my two fat points and my four usual points. And here are, is a curve that has a vertex at these fat points and just passes through the other points. And again, that's the full list of such curves. 
we count them with certain multiplicities and if you add this up you get actually the the number the, the correct number and that's for example i mean i want to emphasize so maybe i mean of this this looks very simple i hope and that's also the purpose of the whole thing because these numbers as i as i mentioned they really um they are really hard to compute and for a long time mathematicians didn't have any clues how to um, approach these problems after only after this um, input from uh, physics um, they started to develop techniques but it's still a very so the machinery behind computing for example Konsevich uh, formula is, is not is, is quite I mean it's, it's, it's a tough problem and the fact that we can translate this into counting some simple graphs in the plane this came as a big surprise when this when these theorems were first discovered and this was of big interest for also again for the for the string theory community um, for various reasons they were interested in, in this kind of reformulations of these counting problems and um, well I guess I should yeah so let me actually so I cannot talk about the third the, the second application at all but it's no problem um, um, let me just mention a few generalizations of this. So there are other counting problems that you can attack using similar methods. For example, Hurwitz numbers, it's a very famous counting problem in, in geometry that you can also solve tropically. And also it's very important, these methods in real counts. So um, these invariants that I defined, this all of this refers to co complex algebraic geometry. So actually we're counting complex curves. And when you try to do the same over the real numbers, then actually this is much more complicated. Often you don't even have existence statements um, or you don't have any lower bounds for the number of solutions. And tropical geometry in a couple of cases was able to provide such lower bounds like for the first time. So there's a famous example for the same type of counting problem that I mentioned before. And then also I, um, two years ago, for example, so that's something a bit more recent, I studied uh, Hurwitz numbers and I used tropical methods to give lower bounds for, uh, yeah, for the real counting problem that corresponds to Hurwitz numbers. So this is just, um, um, yeah, maybe let me just let me just stop here. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much, Johannes. I think we can just open the mics and probably say thank you to Johannes too. Uh, are there any questions? Hay preguntas para Johannes? Estudiantes, profesores. Bueno, yo, yo tengo una pequeña pregunta, pero la verdad es que es una pregunta tan vaga que no sé si, si vale la pena ni siquiera hacerla, pero pues lo voy a hacer. Eh, ¿Alguna vez he escuchado que hay alguna relación entre geometría tropical y lo que uno llama campos valuados o campos con valuaciones? ¿Cierto? Sí. Uh -huh. yeah. ¿Tú sabes cuál es la relación y como qué tipo de cosas puede haber ahí en la mitad? Yeah, so this is a kind of a second approach to this process of tropicalization that I, let me go back. So um, kind of in my, um, in this theorem about how to tropicalize, um, so this was sort of essentially this year, we had this family of um, polynomials showing up, right? And now you, you can um, reformulate this as follows. You can say this is actually this is a polynomial whose coefficients uh, lie in the ring of um, Puiseux series, for example. So some kind of um, mm. functional space, okay? Yeah. And suddenly you are in the range of peels with uh, valuation, okay? And what I'm doing here, note what I'm doing here, I'm taking the, the exponent and I'm, uh, the exponent that gives the growth and I'm turning it into a coefficient. And in the language of valuated fields, this would just be the valuation of, imagine this is a power series, and now I'm mm -hmm. taking 
the maximal term and I take uh, the exponent of the maximal term and I turn it into my coefficient. So that's the, that's the relation. And it's kind of um, two approaches you can formulate um, tropicalization. So this approach using non-Archimedean fields is much more kind of elegant because it relies on all the big, all, like all the features that algebraic geometry can provide. But on the other hand, it's a bit less um, concrete because you don't really see these, you cannot draw these kind of pictures in, in this non-Archimedean setup. Okay. In that? Yeah. Oh, okay, sorry. Okay, now I can go after you answer David's. Yeah, so there's a question by David, is there a tropical Bessou theorem? Uh, so yeah, actually we're gonna do this in the tropical geometry class. There is a tropical Bessou theorem and it has a very beautiful combinatorial proof. Yeah. Yeah, my question was um, in this Poisson series, the domain that you get, like the image is, is Q. So it appears that you can do all tropical geometry over the rationals as opposed to the reals. Um, is there a reason we choose of one or the other? Uh, and it's some, um, so that's a kind of a, <laughs> is a, from my point of view, it's a technical question. So some, most of the time in this non-Archimedean approach, it's just, that's right, you, you get the, the image just lies in Q to, Q to the N, and then you just take the closure of this. Right. And you, and, uh, um, but in, in some construction, so for example, when you come from stable reduction, then sometimes you need to do um, field extensions to, um, to get a stable reduction, which has certain properties. And these field extensions actually correspond to, instead of Q to the N, I'm adding Q to the N, uh, you know, I'm, I'm refining, um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm making the, the points that I, the, that my evaluation goes to finer and finer. And so in, in some... Um, oh, I yeah, see. So like a sequence of things. Yes, exactly. Yeah. But I mean, it's, yeah, in, in the main formulation of tropical geometry, it's more kind of like a technical issue. So even some, uh, some that's why some people use actually precise series which allow um, reals exponents. But, but is, is there a reason to, to use the reals? Like, is there any advantage? Because... I remember, actually, it, <laughs> at some point I was talking to Sternfels and he always claimed that he cannot imagine the real numbers, like, and uh, he uh, likes things over the rationals because they're all constructive. Like, you know what they are and you know what you yeah. get. So, but I don't know, so my question is whether or not there's any advantage to use the real numbers. Well, from my point of view, I want to do geometry with this object, okay? And for example, proving something like this new theorem or talking about intersections, you often need to do the typical stuff you do in geometry, which is moving things a little bit, you know, proving moving lemmas and, and this kind of stuff. So this okay. is why, I guess from this point of view, it's more natural to work over the reels. Uh, but I, yeah, I think most part of the general theory of tropical geometry, you could as well just restrict to rational numbers and there wouldn't be, uh, wouldn't be. Okay, yeah, but the formations are, more subtle. Yes, okay, so thank you. Like okay, thank you. Um, is there any last question for Johannes? Well, if there isn't, then eh, gracias, Johannes, por, por la charla. Uh -huh. y, gracias y gracias a, a todos por venir. Eh, damos entonces por concluido el coloquio de hoy y nos vemos la próxima semana. En la próxima semana vamos a tener a Alexander Bernstein. Entonces, pues de nuevo, muchas gracias. Sí. Chao a todos.